Hey guys, hoping all is well with everybody. In this video, we're going to be continuing the read-along stories of Heroic Dogs by Lou Jefferson. And in this particular video, we're going to be reading and introducing the story of Seaman and Meriwether Lewis. Um, because of the length of this story, it's going to be divided into two separate videos. Um, the first part is going to be about Meriwether Lewis, and the second part is going to be more about the expedition and Meriwether Lewis's dog named Seaman. So let's get started. Seaman and Meriwether Lewis. Let's begin this story with the human instead of the dog. Meriwether Lewis was born in Virginia in 1774. His father died when he was six years old and the family moved to Georgia. It was in Georgia that Lewis made friends with the local Cherokee Indians. He stayed out of doors most of the time. His mother taught him about the herbs used for medicine, and he was curious about all the animals and plants. Lewis was sent back to Virginia when he was 13 to be educated by tutors in his uncle's home. Later, he went to college, graduated, and spent some time in the military. He left the U.S. Army as a captain in 1801 and was hired as a private secretary to Thomas Jefferson, living in the president's mansion. The Lewis family was known to Jefferson as their farm was near Jefferson's home in Virginia. As early as 1792, way before he became president in 1801, Jefferson had been thinking of an expedition to the Pacific coast. At first, his interest was to find a way to go across the continent by boat, that is, to find a northwest passage. He wanted an easy route to all the way to the Pacific to improve trade with Asia. Later, after he purchased the Louisiana Territory from France in 1803, Jefferson had the added need to spread the word throughout the territory that it belonged to the United States. He also wanted to spur commerce in the middle of the country in furs and other natural products to flow to the U.S. and not to other countries. Now, back then the United States ended at the Mississippi River. The Louisiana Territory was a big chunk west of that. Then there were two pieces along the Pacific coast. The larger southern chunk was the Spanish Territory and a smaller northern piece called the Oregon Country. It was already known that you could go from the Mississippi to the Missouri River. The Missouri River is the longest river in North America, while parts of it had been explored by then. Many thought that the Missouri was the Northwest Passage and the flow all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Jefferson officially appointed Lewis to lead the expedition, a commissioned detail of the U.S. Army called the Corps of Discovery in 1803 but he had invited Lewis years earlier to command the trip. Lewis turned to William Clark to be his co-leader. Clark had once been his superior officer in the army, so making him an equal decision maker was a smart move on Lewis's part. Lewis was 30 years old and Clark 33. Before the expedition began, both men were busy gathering geographical information of the regions they would pass through. Lewis had studied medicine and biology, and they both studied astronomy and map making. They also found out as much as they could about the people they were likely to meet along the way. And here's a picture of Meriwether Lewis. Okay. They started with a large keel boat and two pyrogs, one red and one white, and a few canoes. The keel boat, designed by Lewis, was 55 foot long, 8 foot wide at the middle. It had a sail and 22 oars. The mast of this boat broke at least four times during the trip. The pyrogues were smaller boats with sail and six or seven oars. They added men as they progressed. Fifty-nine people made part of the expedition with thirty to forty men the size of the corpse on any one day. Sometimes there were also guides and their families following the corpse. One man died during the expedition, Charles Floyd from appendicitis. One child was born to Sacagawea, the famous Indian woman who accompanied them. The trips on the Mississippi and Missouri were upriver. Not only did they battle against the current and tricky winds, but floating logs, low water, sandbars, rapids, and waterfalls often required miles and miles of portage. Men, of, men or horses pulled the boats much of the time. Boats overturned, supplies were lost. And finally, the Missouri didn't end in the Pacific. It ended in the trickle in the Montana Mountains. They had to descend the Rockies via the Columbia River to the Pacific. They knew of the Rockies but didn't know how high they were. They had expected peaks in the 5,000 foot range. 
They were lucky to cross over the Bitter Root Mountains, which are low for the Rockies, about 10,000 feet, and they found a low 5,300 foot pass through them in the snow, led by a local Indian who was not sure of the way. Lewis started alone with the keelboat from Pittsburgh on the last day of August in 1803 and reached the Pacific Ocean in November of 1805. The group wintered twice during the westward trip and again when they reached the Pacific. Lewis was a moody man and didn't keep a journal regularly. This problem persisted in his delay to write up his notes for publication. Clark also kept a journal and his spelling was amused at scholars for years. They made maps that were fairly accurate. The expedition turned to St. Louis in September of 1806. The expedition sent back 120 specimens of birds, fish, reptiles, and mammals, as well as over 200 plants. Lewis had many adventures and close calls. He almost died falling from a cliff, saving himself by stabbing the cliff with his lance to anchor him. He was accidentally shot by a team member, and he ran into a river and was saved from a charging grizzly bear. He did much of what Jefferson wanted, holding formal meetings with two dozen Indian tribes and meeting with trappers and others, but he did not find the Northwest Passage. The expedition was also not the first to cross the North American continent over land. Alexander Mackenzie did it crossing in Canada years before in 1793. Their return trip from the coast was much faster, being downriver and over familiar ground, and people crowded the riversides along the way when they reached populated areas. They arrived in St. Louis on September 13, 1806. The official expedition took two years, four months, and ten days, and covered 8,000 miles. This did not include the two-and-a-half-month, 1,800-mile trip down the Ohio River that Lewis made with the keelboat from Pittsburgh to Louisville to meet Clark. Many credit their expedition for sparking the migration west. On returning home, Lewis was appointed governor of the Louisiana Territory by Jefferson. He was appointed in March 1807, but didn't arrive to take up the post until March 1808. Tension between Lewis and Territory Secretary Frederick Bates peaked when Bates publicly accused Lewis of financial mismanagement. In 1809, Lewis left the territory to visit Washington to clear up the issue about Bates and to deliver his notes on the expedition to his publisher. Along the way, he was found dead one morning at Grinder's Stand, an inn in Tennessee. He was shot in the head and abdomen and apparent, in an apparent suicide. During the trips east, he made a will and told his companions what to do with his personal effects, that along with Lewis's known mood swings supported suicide as the cause of death, but many still believe he was murdered. He was buried near the inn. His grave was abandoned for quite some time now, but it is a national monument. His notes and notes of Clark were finally assembled by Nicholas Biddle and Paul Allen and published in 2014. Much later, another editor, Elliot Coes, went through the notes of Lewis, Clark, and others and made a more extensive report of the expedition, which was published in 1893. And we'll stop there. And in the next video of part two, we will learn more about Lewis, uh, Meriwether Lewis's dog, Seaman, and the rest of the expedition. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.